from Baltimore, Maryland, weigh 225 and three quarter pounds, wearing green trunks, Benito Gardini. From Argentina, weigh 224 pounds, Antonio the Amazing Rocca. Your referee, Fred Nicholas. You notice that little gesture of Gardini's before, so again we'll have a study of opposites. Gardini said, I use my head, and Rocca uses his bare feet. And here we go. You see that? Rocca constantly moves. Gardini said, hey, what's going on here? Beautifully done. Watch it. You'll see things executed that you've never seen before in your life. Because he can move this boy. There's his stake hold. Looks like he's making chop meat out of Gardini, however. We talked about the power of Joe Stetcher's legs. This boy, besides having power, he has ability to move them. That's Rocker bouncing left. And a right. And another right by Rocker. Mm. There it is. The handstand head scissor by Antonino Rocker. Now he takes himself a nice, beautiful rest. Yeah, we know where your head is. On the ropes, and so the hold is broken. Garth Dini thinks he's in there with the atomic bomb. You don't know where it's going to explode. That's a beautiful leg trip by Antonino Rocca. And a toe hold. You can almost hear those bones crack. Nobody can help you now, Gardini. Nobody but yourself. Combination leg, scissor, and toe hold by Rocca. Everything that comes up must go down. So down goes Gardini. Gardini with a cartwheel. A beautiful drop kick by Rocca. Gardini said, this is getting too much for me. Rap, too much. Which way shall I go? Out. See, I used my head, he said. Five, six. Count went up to six. Roll me around again, says Rocca, and over he goes. Leg lock by Rocca. Always presents a moving target, that Rocca. Again, a leg scissor and toe hold combination by Rocca. Gardini feels like the Rocca Gibraltar. He can't move anywhere. Ride him, 
Young, Cowboy, and down we go. Make him stop jumping up and down, ref. The ref says, get in there and wrestle. Don't bother me. He'll give you a drop kick from any angle, that boy, Rocker. I can do more with my feet than you can do with your hands, says Antonino. See? He uses that leg trip quite a bit. One more time. Attaboy. Now there's one for the book. He can't get his whole shoulders down there to the canvas, but he's got them down there. The human pup tent. Well, anger rears now. If you've ever seen Rocker go berserk. And you know what he'll do. He'll come at him from five different angles all at the same time. That's all, he says. That's enough. You've had your turn. Now look out, brother. Hip roll. Hip roll. A flying mare by Gardini. Right across the Adam's apple to make apple sauce of Rocker. By the hair, a rear chancery, and which way would it go? That away! Right into a beautiful drop kick by Rocker, and again! And again! I would say at this stage of the game, Gardini wants out. And that's where I'd go. Fly there. He goes up five minutes. feet. There's the famous Rocco backbreaker. Gardini will have to give up. Yes, he does. No man can take that one. Benito Gardini conceded that fall, and the winner is the amazing Rocca. The international heavyweight wrestling champion himself, Lou Faz. Welcome to Dressing Room Interviews, Lou. Thank you, Jules. So good to be here again. I believe you're just about the best condition that I've seen you in the last uh, few years. What, what are you doing? What's, what, what goes on? Well, I, I keep training, Jules. I think we discussed this before. I'm, I'm one of the hungry athletes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stay hungry because I constantly train, and uh, I very well remember the days when we did a lot of dry run work in the gymnasium, and uh, I've never tired of it, really. Uh, I still do a lot of uh, working out, that is wrestling. Well, we must wrestle to keep our timing. But uh, aside from that, why well, I do quite a lot of surfing on the beach and skin diving, uh, kind of a beach bum too sometimes. But uh, with the sailing and the whole bit, and uh, I do road work on the beach, uh, Jules. I run <coughs> a mile a day in soft sand with some heavy boots, and that really pulls the cart and keeps you down. Well, thanks a lot, and I hope we'll be seeing more of you. At 229 pounds, international champion, Lou Fez. And his opponent at 225 pounds, Sunland, Vic Christie. Take it away, Red Shoe. Well, our ring announcer introduced Vic Christie from Sunland, California. However, I was talking to Vic a little earlier this uh, today, and he told me that he had moved to Woodland Hills, California. Vic, uh, veteran of the mat, always a fine condition wrestler, against Lou Fez, the international heavyweight wrestling champion. Should be a very fine wrestling match. Oh, 
Christie. Who's Tyler Smiles referee says no close fast. One of the wrestlers though from time to time with this fast with that left hand of his he catches him across the side of the head and they tell the referee I'd like to see him close his fast. Open hand a lot of times can hurt a lot more with a slap into the side of the head and a closed fist. And into the wrist lock, slipping into a head scissors, Fez. And on the ring, it's Fez tossing Christy Clare across the ring. The referee speaks to Fez. As when I ask for a break, I want a good clean break out of both of you. <laughs> These boys are just about the same size. It's a little hard to distinguish between them, except that Christie's the one with the short crew haircut, or flat top, whichever you prefer to call it. Go behind the trip and the takedown by Christie. <laughs> As with an inside step over toe hold, reversing in on Christie. I noticed quite a large red welt on the left side of Fez. He must have uh, picked that up when Christie had him through the ropes between the second and the, and the top rope. Quite a large red bruise spot. There's Christie moving out under the ropes. Referee asks for a good clean break and gets it. Both these boys very scientific. They're a little on the they get a little rugged once in a while, but uh, they both depend on wrestling holes and their knowledge of leverage and balance. <laughs> Christy uses a lot of scissors. In fact, uh, Christy's favorite uh, holes that he uses for defeating his opponents is a flying body scissor. And the same thing with Fez. He uses to a great extent, too. Side headlock, Christy. Moving around. And it's the elbow back into the side of the chin by Christy. And Christy looks out across the ring. Fez moving into an Indian death lock. Doesn't have the foot quite around to the proper point, though, to where he can get the leverage on Christie's leg. I think Christie's moving it out. That's right, Christie maneuvered the foot out from the leg. It's interesting to watch a match like this. Uh, you watch the little things that way because you see how these boys that are on the scientific side of wrestling, how they maneuver the whole just the least bit changes the whole leverage and balance on the whole. Out under the apron, both boys under the apron. Five 
He's a tireless wrestler. Keeps on the go all the time. As with a hammer lock, it is good for the fall as Christie submits to the fall. Let's get our ring announcer, Way Meadow, in and see what the time of the fall was. And both boys moving in. Introducing from Los Angeles, California, weighing 245 pounds, Mike Valentino. His opponent from Paris, France, weighing 230 pounds, the heavyweight champion of the world, Edouard Carpentier. The referee, Eddie Creechman. The great applause, of course, was for the recognized heavyweight champion of the world, Edward Carpentier. And his displays, of course, have thrilled fans for many years all around this world. Mike Bella Valentino from Los Angeles. Big fellow, rangy type. And, uh, oh, and a tip by Valentino to punch the punch here, fails. And they lock again in the referee hole with the big fellow forcing the issue. And uh, there goes the field. He didn't get the punch here very far. Slap of disdain, right across the face of oh, Valentino. This fellow Carpentier has defeated the greats in wrestling. I refer, of course, to Killer Kowalski, to Buddy Rogers, and their like. Kowalski, incidentally, is now on a tour of Japan. And Carpentier ever insists that it was he that chased him out of the country. Capuntia tying up Valent uh, Valentino. And it's very hard to describe a whole such a verse. It is such, uh, such an unorthodox one. Valentino stepping between the ropes to get away from uh, Capuntia. And Valentino starting to hammer his man. Puts the front face lock, but his skin's broken up as it was a choke. Hamelock, Hamelock plays by Capontier. Edward Capontier has a, has quite a variety of holes. And uh, Valentino, no doubt, will feel the full effect of these before he's finished. <laughs> Edward Capontier getting the head to the midriff of Valentino. Although he hails from uh, Los Angeles, uh, now uh, Valentino originally uh, came from the island of Malta in the Mediterranean Sea. And of course, uh, that little island there was one of the, uh, was probably the most heavily bombed area of land. Of, uh, during the Second World War. Capontier down on his shoulders, rolling off. And I must apologize to my French friend uh, for my uh, pronunciation, if it is not correct. Oh, the count went to two on Valentino. 
and he must have got a finger to the eye of Kapunchia. Kapunchia distress after that eye gouging. And a nasty one it was as Valentino taking, uh, taking advantage of the situation. Kapunchia is a uh, anger and comes back at him. And the forearm jaw coming up heavy under the chin. Valentino appealing now for Kapunchia to stand back. He's a big rangy fellow, Valentino, and bears watching all of the time. He has met some of the, the best in uh, the wrestling profession. And against the great Edward Kapuncia, he is against the best. Here's the referee going in for the count. I will say that official move fast. Valentino backing into the corner. If ever you have the opportunity in your uh, local arena to watch the great uh, Kapunchia in action, I do advise you to take advantage of it. Because he's a great, uh, great performer. And Valentino now hammering away at him in the corner is ordered back by the official. The referee becoming a little impatient with Valentino and there could be a disqualification. If he does not watch out. Five uh, minutes. Hammering him up as they are urging on. Valentino getting out of the ring. Must have uh, witnessed a glint in the eye of the great French performer. Ah, uh, Valentino getting a fast count from the official. He claims that the referee is being unfair. Well, I do not think so. <laughs> nice knee lift by Capunchi as he moves in with a flying bear. Takes down Valentino and puts, puts a twist to the head. Valen oh, Valentino kicking Capunchi, but he has a great gymnast somersaulting. Oh, a, a beautiful move, another one, another somersault right onto the chest of Valentino, and Valentino's in trouble as Capuccia goes over the counter to the two, to three, a beautiful four. I'm sure that you agree with me that that was certainly a most spectacular fall, uh, which proves that Capuccia is one of the great gymnasts of this day, besides being an outstanding wrestler. Hey, you want your milk? And uh, may I shake hands with you? Yes. An excellent performance. You have quite a chair squad there behind. Thank you very much. You know, I'm very glad and I'm very happy to back on this uh, TV show in Ottawa. I think it's the best TV I never see before. Is that right? And yeah. you've seen some television around this world? Yeah, because I'm going every place, everywhere, coast to coast, you know. I think this TV is something. Well, you've got yourself all nicely tanned up, and uh, it's quite obvious that in your travels to defend the title, you've been hitting some sunshine. No, I just uh, come from San Francisco. I went the uh, champion coast from San Francisco last week. Is that right? Yes. Very, very nice, and thank you, Edward, thank you for coming much. around. Bruno's playmate for the evening is Magnificent Maurice. Even before the action gets underway, the fans show their disapproval of the Magnificent One. Maurice tries to be a good sport about it by shaking hands before the match, but he follows this gesture by clouding Bruno on top of his head, and the fight is on. Maurice pleads for mercy from his corner. Now the two Goliaths engage in a bit of stand-up Indian wrestling. 
Maurice gets the edge by pulling Bruno to earth by his locks. The referee scolds Maurice for his action, but the fans love it. Bruno may be in a bad way if he hasn't a large bottle of aspirin for after the fight. Early Bruno retaliates by bouncing back. Then he goes to work on Maurice's fair skin. Maurice is back in form after a brief setback. Bruno then puts his 264 pounds to work by bouncing Maurice once again. Then he skips into the crowd to be with his fans. This lady has a few words of encouragement for Bruno, and he decides he'd be safer in the ring. Bruno climbs back with blood in his eyes, and this spells trouble for Maurice. Bruno tries to embrace his companion. The loving bear hug is so effective that it squeezes the breath from Maurice, and that's all for the evening. Maurice will be the first to tell you the Italian Superman is here to stay. Well, look what we got on camera. Welcome to the horror show. Look at that. I've seen better heads on cabbages, haven't you? There he is, hero of uh, the Mau Mau tribe, Carl Von Hess. Killer Carl Varhess, who just got his little head slapped by a Ricky Star. And if you're the type who likes fireworks, well, we're going to shoot off several rockets right here, believe me. Ricky Star versus Carl Von Hess. The next event, ladies and gentlemen, one fall to a finish, a one hour time limit. Introducing at this time the referee for this bout, referee Sandor Kovacs. Thank you. At this, <laughs> at this time, ladies and gentlemen, Greenwich Village, 201 pounds, the sensational of uh, wrestling today, ladies and gentlemen, a warm reception for Ricky Starr. His opponent from Germany, 220 pounds, Carl von Hess. come to the most important part of this match. Ricky Starr will toss one of his little ballet slippers, I hope, in this direction, because Harvey Jerome would like to have it. See there? Looks like I'm gonna wind up marrying Ricky Starr because I caught the wreath. Sandor Kovacs uh, frisking what's left of Ricky Starr. Ricky's letting his hair go out on his chest. Watch this now. Uh, Mr. Von Hess will now submit to... Uh, this will be a wild one. They're off now. First, Ricky has to get loose, of course, with a few demi-plies and whatnot.
Very pretty, isn't it? Welcome to the Sadler Wells Ballet. The Sandy Sadler Billy Wells Ballet. Sandy Sadler Orson Wells Ballet. Watch this. Huh? That's a lovely pair of trunks that Ricky almost has on, aren't they? I think Von Hess just gets uglier and meaner. Me, I just get uglier. wearing white ballet shoes tonight, and Von Hess wearing a snarl. I think Von Hess is going to try to shout Ricky out of the ring. Right on, star. Just loosening up. Nothing wrong with that. Wish you would loosen up out of camera, though. This is a family network, you know. Funny how some athletes uh, use one form of calisthenics and others use another, isn't it? And some of them are like Ricky Starr. He wants to be buddy buddy. The star answers him in sign language, which means dash, dash, dash. program sponsored by Bumps and Grinds Incorporated. Most of the gyrations that Ricky used were taught him by Toots Mont, an old burlesque star. You remember Toots. He was the best man for Dame Mae Whitty, Mae Bush, Abner Doubleday, and Pocahontas. We don't get much wrestling. Uh-oh. I don't think that Ricky meant to hit Mr. Von Hess that hard. We don't get much wrestling down here, but we do have a lot of fun, don't we? See, Star's a good wrestler when he wants to be, when he cuts out the clowning. But who wants him to cut out the clowning?
Devon Hess is uh, apparently not, uh, didn't have his dinner. Got a little, uh, they're not whispering. Devon Hess is just biting Ricky's ear. Ricky will have to wrestle with only one ear. Terrible disadvantage. Zacco just came in here, just arrived from Tokyo with Lou Thez. Phil, say a few words in Japanese for us, will you? Uh, Phil prefers not to speak. Ricky reminds me a lot of those wrestling midgets, doesn't he? Except those midgets are a little taller. Ricky's hair is set by Eddie Taylor, who also is our timer here. Bob Freed does his nails. Von Hess's hair is set by the Washington Concrete Company. He's a hard-headed chap. just like the midgets do it. Oh, Ricky missed then. Not then. Stars on the way now. Well, I didn't see any count, did you? We got something going with Kovacs and Von Hess. Hess complains he got a quick count. the law of the ring microphone because Carl might grab it and say a few thousand words which could conceivably get us off the air. The one guy we do trust though is our old pal Bob Freed. The winner, the sensational Ricky Stark. Well, this thing getting over yet. That is, watch this. Double cross. I saw it. Well, that sort of wraps it up, friends. That's about anyway. Don't forget our little interview section is going to follow. Just let me tell you that the winner of this match, as if you didn't know, the winner of this match between Ricky Starr and Carl Von Hess was a Ricky Starr. 
Well, this is Vern Gagne, a former great University of Minnesota football player against Butcher Boy Henny, who comes from Iowa. Watch him go to work on this hand of Gagne's now. You're in good position here. He's going after the rope to cut off the circulation. He's got it underneath his hand. Luce goes is in there looking now. But he's got the string covered up with his hand. There it is. The handing, cover, handing covers it up, but now he gets back and slips it inside his trunks. Actually, it's just a string from his trunks. like swapping a BB gun for uh, an atomizer. Gagne really teed off on him that time. There's a hip roll by Gagne. Headlocked by Henning. And Henning says, now I always say, look out. Leg trip, but Henning didn't want to come. Henning didn't want to go on that one. Gagne rolling the boat down the stream now. Tremendous amount of pressure on Henning's leg. And Henning is doing a crawl right for the ropes. He's getting closer. what Gagne's devised now. Oh, it's a version of the Boston Crab. It's a finishing hole. This could be it. Depends on how much Henning can take here. Oh, that hurts. Henning is still saying no, though. Look at that, he's inching toward the ropes despite all the pain and pressure now. I don't know how you feel about Lee Henning, but we've got to give him credit for a lot of courage. There's a fellow who's taken a lot of pain. And it's easy to give up in there, you know. It's easy to say I've had enough, but he's not doing it. is trying to get hold of Gagne's hair there, but Byrne has it cut rather short. He did get hold of an ear. That's regulation size. Did you hear that? He said, why, why, why? He's trying to pull my leg off, isn't he? And he was. Got to say that. Vern was trying to get it off. Probably beat him over the head with it. is in control. He's got an arm lock there. Using that right leg of his to do it.
Gagne continues to work on the underpinning of Lee Henning. Look at Lee right on his head this time, and he's got there. Some a fan was hollering at Gagne and telling him what to do, and Henning suddenly hollered, "Shut up!" He's the little man that wasn't there that time. Gagne was there that time. <laughs> Henning now is digging those nails into the eyes of Gagne underneath him. Doing it again. Now he's really splatting them. You can hear those socking in there. There goes Gagne out of the ring. There comes Gagne back in there. Watch him. Oh, he hit Luz Goza. Now he gets Henning. Shoulder blocks he's throwing. There's another one. Look out, Lou. Gagne coming up out of the ring, and he's mad about this whole situation. Oh, he's twisting and turning, and he's got Lee Henning going. There's a sleeper. He's putting the sleeper hold on him. Got the sleeper hold on him. And there goes Lee Henning off into the land of dreams. Lee won't get out or get up. Gagne is telling Scoza he can count to 150. And maybe that's a little high, but Henning will not be able to rise for a few moments. Vern Gagne, aroused by being kicked and thrown out of the ring, came back like a tiger to finish off Lee Henning in quick order. Vern Gagne, the winner. From Russia, weighing 242 pounds, wearing black trunks, Kola Quariani. From Chicago's north side, known as Mr. America, weigh 222 pounds, wearing black trunks, Gene Stanley. Your referee, Fred Nicholas. Well, once again, we're all set. I don't have to tell you which one is Gene Stanley. He's got hair. And man, what hair he's got. So it's Gene Stanley now on the right, Cola Quadriani on the left. The Gene is a real showman. Quadriani breaks nice and clearly, which naturally surprises everybody. Japanese arm like in there by Stanley, and a monkey flip by Gene. Don't you love the way Gene just prances around that ring? Rear chancery by Gene Stanley. And a hip roll by Stanley. He 
He's really applying that pressure at this point. He was apparently applying more than pressure because referee had to break the hold. Probably got a thumb in the eye there. We couldn't see it from our angle. Has a waist lock on the ropes. Stanley breaks cleanly and one for good measure, a leg trip. Stalks away confidently, smiling at those females down yonder. You wonder why sometimes he doesn't really aggravate the wrestler, but aggravating the wrestler or not, he pleases the ladies. Hair pull that time by Cola Quariani, which puts Gene at a decided disadvantage. There's a headlock and a counter move, a head scissor by Mr. America. Man, it looks like a crystal ball from this angle. Now you'll notice that this is a rest hold for Gene Stanley. All he does is apply a little bit of pressure and now gets the pleasure of pride to him. Not for long. There's a beautiful flying mare by Stanley. Watch for this flying tackle by Stanley. Gene going berserk. What that boy can do to a crowd. Front chancer in the back body drop. Cola Quariani, the bus now. Which quiets the spectators down a little bit. Gene Stanley coming from the north side of Chicago has a big following here. Headlock by Gene Stanley. She likes it. A beautiful waist lock. He's getting set now for the spread eagle. So he takes a leg split instead. Lola Quariani just tearing those legs apart. A look of complete frustration on the face of Gene Stanley now. He's, he's got to figure himself way out, and there it is. The Indian Deathlock is a counter move. Incidentally, that Indian Deathlock is also a counter move, the spread eagle or the cradle. takes is a little gesture like that to send the crowd wild. Okay. Okay. And they're under the ropes. Referee breaks the hold. Gene breaks almost cleanly and stalks away. It's Cola Quadiani with his back to us. Gene Stanley in the corner. About to spring. Oh, no, you don't.
a beautiful cartwheel by Coriani. Gene says, all right, if that's the way you want to play, we'll play. All right. Fly <laughs> Mare by Stanley. And a beautiful double knee smash by Stanley. Headlock, crotch hole, and a body slam by Stanley. This is the way to wear a man down. There it is again. Well, three for good measure. Ooh, and a body press by Gene. This could be it. Yes, yes, yes. And Stanley does it again. He's going to help him up. Halfway. A body press. The winner, Sta Gene Stanley. So wrestling fans head for the arena, where they're treated to a championship match between the challenger Bobo Brazil and his worthy opponent, handsome Johnny Barron, the current champion. While Brazil awaits the grand entrance of Barron, he signs some autographs for his many fans. And here comes handsome Johnny with his faithful valet leading the way. Barron looks like one of the characters you might see in a Charlton Heston movie as he parades around the ring with his cloak and yum-yum stick. It doesn't take long to establish who's who in a wrestling match, but just for the record, the champ is the bad guy, and the challenger is a sentimental favorite. Before the match even gets started, Handsome Johnny tries to attack Brazil with his candy cane, or whatever that thing is. But Bobo takes it away from him and retaliates. Just say abracadabra, Bobo, and they'll both disappear. Once it's been decided as to the participants in this brawl, Brazil goes to work on Johnny Barron. But the eighth wonder of the world decides he'd better take a powder fast before Brazil rides him into space. Bobo was the former champ until he lost his heavyweight title to Barron in Cleveland. Now, with a good chance to get it back, Brazil is making an all-out effort to permanently rid himself of handsome Johnny as he chases him right out of the ring. Here comes Diamond Jack with some words of advice to aid Barron in his darkest hour. That Jack fella is just bubbling over with wisdom and Baron responds immediately. Brazil is down and Johnny is up, but not for long. Bobo doesn't hang around to find out what it's like to get a knee in the bread basket. Baron can hardly stand it as he looks for a little sympathy in act one of a classic performance. They reverse head holds, then Baron rides into a real haymaker that almost puts his lights out. Diamond Jack says some magic words to his boy, then Handsome Johnny recovers enough for a winding windup. Using Baron for a football, Brazil boots him all over the place, but the tide changes all of a sudden. Baron gets out of a head scissors by dumping Brazil off the ring apron and into the seats. The fans yell for Bobo to get back into the ring before he's disqualified. Unfortunately, Brazil doesn't make it, and handsome Johnny Barron successfully defends his title in Summer Stock's top attraction of the wrestling world. Sam Steamboat, come on in, Sam. Come around here, let us get a good look at this uh, athlete. Sam is the heavyweight wrestling champion of Hawaii, and he is also he also hosts some other championships. Tell us about it, Sam. Well, uh, I went home in December and we defended our canoe championship. Uh, we hold a world's record for paddling uh, eight hours continuously from one island to another. 
This is the outrigger. This is the outrigger canoe racing. And they hold those each year, don't they? Uh, we hold that uh, once a year, the island to island, but we have a race that comes every week. Every Sunday we have a race. And uh, you say uh, eight hours. Now, you, you paddle continuously for eight continuously hours? Continuously for eight hours. About how much uh, uh, distance will you cover? Uh, we would cover somewhere in between 60 to 65, 65 miles. Oh, man, that's not... I'm an Indian, but I never did paddle that far, you know. At 225 pounds from Hawaii, Sam Steamboat. His opponent at 260 pounds, Canada, Big Mike Shark. Take it away, Dugan. Red Shoes Dugan, the referee tonight. Red Shoes, quite a wrestler himself, a light heavyweight wrestler. Wrestled uh, all over the country, in Canada and Mexico. And now he's a referee, and a very fine referee, too. He does a real good job. This bout is Sam Steamboat the Hawaiian wrestling champion, meeting Big Mike Shark. <laughs> Sam Steamboat, a boy that uh, Lou Fez discovered while he was in Honolulu. He was an amateur wrestler there. Lou discovered him, took him under his way. A real top notch wrestler of this boy. Real powerhouse. Hey, watch him go. It's sharp. There's a sharp down on the mat. Incidentally, this boy, Sam Steamboat, is left handed, as you probably already noticed, the same as the fellow that trained him, Lou Fez. So you see a lot of moves that you think look familiar to you. They're probably those that you've seen Lou Fez make. Lou Fez, you know, is the international heavyweight wrestling champion and one of the truly great wrestlers of our time. I think you're seeing a boy right now that's just going to be tops. Yes, sir. Young fella, tremendous all-around athlete, holds the outrigging championship of the island. And a boot to the midsection by Sharp. Steamboat down on the floor, Red Shoes Dugan, head close. Watches the hold, says it isn't a choke, though. Jobs in wrestling. Evo <laughs> trying to get the leverage on the left arm. Uh, Sharp, once again, it's a handful of tights. Red Shoes goes in the wrong place in his back. The crowd can't break it up. And Dugan does break it up. All for a count. Between the two. And as it comes in, it's Steamboat. The left, the next side, the middle one. And as it comes in, it's down. Goes Big Mike Sharp. Out over the ropes with both feet. Champion Sam Steamball. You people have been over to the islands. You probably that name is very familiar to you. This boy's daddy was the head beach boy there at Waikiki Beach for years, and he was raised right on the beach. You've probably seen young Sam there too. 
Lynch. We're going to see a lot more of him in the wrestling ring because this boy is a real comer. He's in against a tough man tonight. One of the top contenders for the championship. tonight, Big Mike Sharp of Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, 275 pounds, six foot seven. Real giant of a man. Real top-notch conditioned athlete, too. to the head of Sharp. This Sharp has a tremendous neck, though. I think he has about a 21 and a half inch neck. Makes a lot of power to hurt that neck of his. Another big turnaway crowd in our stadium here tonight. Wrestling stars in the 60s. Let's see if Hogan breaks up the hole. He says the leg of Steamboat had slipped down with a choke hole. Steamboat says it isn't a choke. Hogan checking it very carefully. to the head says a complete rollover. End of the ropes. Dugan asked for a break. And it's Steamboat following Sharp across the ring. He feels like he has an advantage. He wants to follow it up. And he walks into that big number 14 of Sharp right in the midsection. And another one, right across the heart. Why, those are the ones that tell the story. Who with another one right across the heart? This boy Sharp is wild now. He's on the go. Watch 
Panthers point to the goal. Mike Sharp's got a powerful forearm smash. You can hear it all over the arena. I went into the throat. Before Sharp placed that foot right over the heart, that one caught Steamboat right across the throat. Ten minutes gone, five minutes to go. <laughs> Crossbody scissor by Sharp. Sharp continues to hold the cross body scissor on Steamboat. Steamboat trying to maneuver back to his feet, manages to turn Sharp over, get him a little off balance, but Sharp still holding those legs around the midsection. Sharp trying to tell the referee that Steamboat was choking him. However, the hands were not down to the throat. And Steamboat does make his way to the third and round. Sharp back into the corner turn buckle. Three minutes to go. Three. Three minutes to go. Moves in for a Told you this boy Sharp was one of the top contenders. You see why now he fights back from everywhere. Steamboat put out enough tonight to defeat almost any wrestler in the country. But Sharp, they're fighting all the
Everything's fine. Murray, may I may I say to you, I don't know whether I'm I'm uh, advertising, I guess, myself in Camden, New Jersey as Sorry, one of the man. oldest look up there, as one of the man. oldest wrestling towns in the country. And November the twenty fifth is going to be the first show they've had there in quite a few years. Twenty fifth of November. We right? hope they come out. Yes, we do. And if you want to stay overnight, the great Scott has a motel that it's uh, fine. No, it's not my <laughs> good luck to you, Scotty. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank All you right, Scotty, much. good. Final match of the evening pits the great Scott and wrestling's biggest drawing card, Argentina Rocca, against the Von Hess brothers, Carl and Eric, in a tag team match. Carl Von Hess in the black trunks is receiving some outside help from brother Eric in his battle with the great Scott. The Scott shows what he thinks of the help. Carl finds himself in a vice-like hold by the great Scott, who gets some help from teammate Argentina Rocca. Rocca is chased from the ring by referee Benson, but he offers advice from the apron. Once again, Rocca rushes to the aid of his partner, who's having trouble in the Von Hess corner. Referee Joe Benson has to order Rocca from the ring, and Rocca isn't happy with the request. The great Scott shows he can take care of himself, and has Carl Von Hess begging for mercy. Referee Benson becomes involved in an argument with the great Scott, and Benson does a guerrilla act to settle the argument. Rocca shows the flying drop kick that has made him famous and given him a reported earning power of $150,000 a year. He completely outclasses Eric Von Hess with his acrobatic antics. Antonio Rocca, the agile Argentine, and the great Scott outdo the Von Hess brothers to win the match and send action-hungry fans home with a full evening of fun under their belts.
Well, exactly, uh, inviting you to see the, 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 the best of the worst, or like uh, the, the things that we've, I, my, from my great collection, that is, if I'm stammering and stuttering, it's gone so excited. <laughs> like, like, like this person's. Possibly the murderer used an electric drill. Yeah. And the person who did it is an expert in anatomy, too. I wish they'd find some way to control the subjects a man studies. A maniac with a lot of knowledge is a threat. I will perfect my own race of people. A race of atomic supermen which will conquer the world. slow moving chief yeah they're dead they're all messed up do you know who that man is oh sure that's dr lejos no that's dracula dracula you mean yes and that woman with him looks like another of his victims Oh, oh damn it. And of course, it's all part of Zachary's Horrible Horrible. That's, that's me, Zachary, and the Horrible Horribles on these film collecting things. I've, I've been collecting for years and years and years. And uh, I've condensed them all so you can, uh, you can go crazy. <laughs> Very quickly. <laughs> well, it's time for me to go, so uh, that's all I can tell you. Just uh, look out for Zachary's Horrible Horribles, all right? Bye-bye. <laughs>